to the nearest NASA international internship experience from our 2014 injury step on assigned. I'd like to thank the Department of Computer Science, Mr. Bhagwan Dean, for facilitating the seminar. Dr. Mohan, for your ongoing collaborations with NEHIRS. Um, I'd like to thank my, acknowledge my NEHIRS staff, um, distinguished guests, and interested individuals. Welcome. This is Stefan's final presentation on his experience. He had one a few weeks ago on his trip to California, and he showed us his journey to the Golden Gate Bridge, Union Square, um, Silicon Valley, and it definitely seems like a different world out there. But for me, this is a more exciting presentation, because this is where we see the research that was conducted at NASA, and really what is, this, what is required as an intern at NASA. So in case you missed that seminar, I spoke on the initial agreement between NEHIRS and NASA in 2012 to facilitate this program, which is a structural educational exchange among Trinidadian um, graduates and NASA's science and engineering workforce to enhance the understanding of the STEM field, which is science and technology, engineering and mathematics, as well as develop their research skills and leadership abilities in efforts to benefit our society here in Trinidad today. As Stefan is currently working at the computer and science department, uh, implementing new projects based on this research that you're about to see here today. And I must compliment Stefan on his research and congratulate him because his mentor has requested his return and he's due to return for his summer internship based on this to continue. So congrats on that. We also have an intern returning at the end of May his background is electrical engineering, and we may conduct similar seminars, so please visit our website for updates on that and other opportunities offered by NEHIRS. Thank you again for coming, and we'll have a short Q&A after with Stefan, so in case you want to ask him what is MATLAB or whatnot, I actually asked him to go real technical, so you can really get that feel of what is required as an intern at NASA. All right? Thank you again for coming. Hi, well, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, so as Sean said, this is going to be the technical presentation. So I'm going to get a bit slightly in-depth into some of the research I did at NASA. Now, I know some people here might not, well, might not be familiar with machine learning. Well, that's the topic I did. And so I tried to give a good balance between going very technical and at a higher level so that the general audience could hopefully understand some of the stuff that I'm talking about. Hopefully it doesn't bore you guys too much. And so I have this legend here, right? So because of technical presentation, it might get boring at times. So in order to understand what to listen to, the emoji with the shades is cool stuff. Things that I find I found that I did was cool, things that was happening in NASA that was cool. Then there's the um, Greenland emoticon, easy stuff. Just general things that I'll talk about. And then there's the scared face, right? Which is when I get a bit technical. So if you don't understand everything that I'm talking about, when you see that um, screamy face, it's okay, okay? <laughs> so at NASA, I did three main projects. Well, these aren't the names of the projects. These are the algorithms I'll be talking about. So the first project, I, when I came to NASA, I helped a previous intern finish up his work. And the main algorithm we used was inductive monitoring system. I'll get into that. The second algorithm was RANSAT, random sampling consensus. And the third, which is not really an algorithm, it's a toolbox called the Accept. So I'll explain each one in detail. As I said, the first one, um, it was a uh, my colleague, the previous intern, and me worked on the first one, and the second one, I worked on it independently. The third one is what I did my poster and my presentation on at NASA. So that this took up the majority of time. So, first um, scary face, right? So, what is IMS? As I said, IMS is an inductive monitoring system, and it was actually developed by a guy called David Iverson at NASA. He was actually working in my department, and I was lucky enough to meet him. And his system basically detects false 
is the algorithm basically detects faults in systems. So it's done quite well at NASA and it's actually implemented in the International Space Station um, in fighter jets and also it's implemented in other um, fields like water quality control. So it's a quite diverse um, algorithm that we're dealing with here. So there are two steps to IMS. There's the training and then there's the monitoring. So for the training, you can have any system that's willing to give inputs, uh, give, willing to give you data about how it's currently operating. So a system could be, as you see there, a satellite. It will tell it like the temperature, the altitude, etc. You want for the jet, it could be the again the height, the distance, the speed it's going at, etc. So for it could do almost any system that's willing to give data about its performance. So after you get the data, the next step in the algorithm is to create some vectors. And these vectors could be n-dimensional, it doesn't matter how long the vectors are, but each vector is normalized. And normalized means we just want to basically have, instead of having um, a column with 100 and a column with 1, we want to normalize each, um, each of the columns to something like, for 100 you'll have something like 1, and for 1 you'll have something like 0 0.1 or something, something smaller. You want to, uh, you don't want there to be such a big disparity between um, the inputs. So we normalize. So then you see cluster to the number. This line here, clustered. So how do we go about doing that? So after we take our input and we convert it into vectors, the next thing we do is we do clustering. So the first vector is converted into a cluster by itself. Then each subsequent vector we take and we check the Euclidean distance between the vector and um, all the clusters that are in the knowledge base thus far. So the Euclidean distance, for those who don't know, a simplified question is just the distance between um, two points, basically. That's, a, that's just a general um, definition. And there is a threshold called, which we could just call delta. And if the vector is within that threshold, the distance between the vector and the the cluster, any cluster, if it is within that threshold, it will be added to that cluster. If it is outside of the threshold, it will be its own cluster. So it's simple enough thus far. And it does that for all the vectors. Now, one, note, one thing you should note about this is that all the um, data that we get from the system are, is nominal, meaning it's normal operations. We don't accept data that is faulty. So it's only um, when the data is operating correctly, we take that, um, those inputs. And thus we create our knowledge base. So the knowledge base basically represents the nominal operations of our system. So this is what we do for our training. Then we come to um, the monitoring phase. So we actually take the, the algorithm that we implemented, the training, our knowledge base, and put it into the real world. And it will monitor the system. And every time the knowledge base gets an input, it will determine how far, so it gets the input, converts it to a vector, and determine how far um, the vector is from either from any cluster in the knowledge base. So if a cluster is in one of, sorry, if a vector is in one of the clusters, it will be called um, a nominal data point, meaning that the system is operating correctly. And if a vector is outside of any of the clusters in the knowledge base, it will um, be called anomalous, right? So that's basically how it works. And if it's anomalous, it will send out an alarm to the user. So why, why did we even, um, why did I even talk about IMS? It's because we wanted to apply it to this situation. So for the problem we had was that we were monitoring a device, right? And this device had three modes. Uh, a full power mode, where it's on running, uh, idle mode, which is an intermediate um, state, and a standby mode. For the standby mode, if you see the blue, the blue is the nominal um, operations. So the standby mode, it's supposed to be pulling around 13 watts. So that's the blue here. And when we looked at more data, we realized that at some point in time, July 25th, it was actually pulling in, it was actually the power that it was drawing was actually 20. So this was an anomaly. And we wanted to see what if we could implement IMS to detect, not only malfunctions for this specific device, but any device in NASA's um, sustainability base. So the sustainability base is the building that I was working on. So we wanted to implement an algorithm where we can take 
this system that we built and apply it to any device throughout the building and we could determine whether the system is running in running correctly or running um, in an anomalous state. So the solution, we use IMS, we trained it on the nominal data, so that's all the data before July the 25th. And then we did some stuff, we did feature selection. So feature selection basically is just there's a, there's a number of features that they, they, we had a number of features that ha we had available to us. And some of the features were like frequency, voltage, power, minimum power draw, average power draw. We eventually found only two features were necessary to model the system, and that was the minimum power draw and the maximum power draw. Then we had transient removal. This means that, so for the system we were monitoring, we were getting data every minute. So within that minute, it could be that the system went from a full power on mode to um, idle or uh, standby mode, or vice versa, from standby or idle to power. And this will give you an incorrect um, data point. So we removed all of those um, transients, as they call it, so that the data that we entered into IMS would be actual nominal data, not any anomalous points. And then we had RLC analysis. So RLC stands for Receiver Operating Crystal Characteristic. And what it did is that we used this analysis to determine the, how accurate our system um, is. So if you take a look here, this is basically a plot of the RLC. And here we have the false positive rate. So a false positive rate means that when the system says something is anomalous, but it really isn't. And the true positive rate is when something is um, anomalous and the system says it's anomalous. So these are the two, um, two uh, points that we use. And then after we gather those two points, where you see they have the dot, is that we can move that dot along that curved, um, that curved line to determine how accurate we want it, whether we want a high true positive rate or false or, or low false positive rate. So we actually chose um, equal. So we, we wanted to have an equal number of true positive rate and an equal um, false positive rate. That's what we chose. And hyperparameter selection. So as I said there in IMS, when you're getting a vector and you want to create a cluster, you want to assign it to a cluster or let it be a cluster itself, there's a threshold um, we can call delta. So delta is one of the parameters that we um, played with. So a smaller delta would mean that there is more clusters, but more clusters would mean more memory and it'll be, um, the IMS system will operate slowly. And we don't want our IMS system to operate slowly. Why? Because we want it to be real time, as close to real time as possible. So, um, hopefully, I will, uh, this video will work. So, this video is the one I um, actually implemented for NASA. It's on NASA's website. My mentor actually liked the video and his boss. So, they put it up on NASA's website. I don't have the link. You can't really see this link here, right? So, I will try to see if it will play. Will it play? All right, it's not playing. So I guess I can try um, after. So basically, it was the this video was basically trying. Okay. Oh, okay, good. So basically, this was the device we were monitoring. It was sending data to um, this plug load, which was um, monitoring the power that the device was drawing. And this was sent to a bridge, and the bridge sent it to NASA's cloud servers. And we took the data from the cloud servers and we implemented our system, the IMS system, and we trained it. And that, that's what we did initially. So when this moves along, good. So this is the day before the anomaly. So every time I talk about IMS is here. So here is the power that the device is drawing. So right now it's drawing 13 watts. And these are, this is the time. Here's the cluster map. As I said, IMS creates clusters. So these are some of the, clus these are the clusters that it, um, it, it built. As you can see, the point is inside a cluster. So if it's inside a cluster, it means that it's operating correctly. And here is the IMS score and the anomaly score. So um, I'll explain that um, shortly. But basically, what, what this wants to do is that it's saying how anomalous the input that you get is. So right now, it's zero, meaning that this is a correct state that the device should be in. And this is... Um, 
this is what I built, and we will get shortly to see day 25, July 25th, which is when there is actually an anomaly, and you'll see um, the anomaly scores go up, and you'll see the points in the cluster um, go out, the point there would go outside of clusters rather than being inside some of the clusters. So let's take a look at that. So initially, again, it starts off operating normally. The, the, it's on at 12 in the night for some strange reason, right? And then it goes down to 20, which is not what we want. And when it goes down to 20, you see the point is outside a cluster. And well, it's red right here for visual purposes. And it shows up some alarms here, saying that, oh, this state here is incorrect. So this is what we actually use. And we implemented it in NASA's building and it showed that it worked correctly. And this is exactly what we wanted. So why did we do this? One reason is because the sustainability base, the main drive behind it is going to be sustainable. Right? We wanted to use as least energy as it could. A lot of renewable um, resources, devices, uh, built into the system. And the first benefit is that when a device is drawing more power, um, that I showed you, it doesn't have to be the device we use, any device, it will flag an alarm so the maintenance staff will come and fix it and deal with it. And secondly, least the second and not so important one is for the vendors to be accountable for the, um, the products that they sell at NASA. So those, those, that is the first um, problem, the first project that I worked on. And this project falls with, within the accept um, scope, but I described this a little bit because it's what I did. I implemented this algorithm into the Accept toolbox. So what RANSAC is, it's a robust regression method. So again, don't get too scared. Basically regression, we just want to fit a line, we want to get the best fit um, of a line with, with some data points. So when you were in um, high school and in physics and you wanted to draw the best fit line after you get a set of dots, that best fit line, this is a very um, easy de description of what regression is. And robust regression means that the algorithm is actually very good at removing outliers. So outliers are basically errors in, um, in uh, measurement, etc. Anything that's not a nominal operation is an outlier. And this algorithm is as follows. There are two parts. Hypothesis generation and hypothesis evaluation. I wouldn't um, read the maths too much of it. I'll show you guys a diagram. So the first step, hypothesis generation, what we do is we want to select some set of data points. We want to select data points that um, we want to select data points that would min that we would use to minimize our model. So let me explain that a little bit. So if, so in this case we have a 2D plane, I want our model is a line. So the minimum number of points to draw a line is two. So that's why we select these two here, that circle in red. Um, if you want to draw a circle, you need three points to draw a circle, the minimum three points to draw a circle, so you need three points. So what, what RANSAC does, it initially randomly selects the minimum number of points to create the model, whatever the model is. In this case, it's a straight line, so the minimum number of points to create a straight line is two. And then after it creates the um, it creates the hypothesis, we want to evaluate it. So I can show you a little bit of the maths here. So basically, to evaluate the hypothesis, we want to minimize the cost function. What is the cost function? This is the cost function basically here. So it's zero if the point is within our model, and it's one if it is outside of our model. So here, this line here is our model. Then we have this D delta, which says that any points within these two, um, these two distances are considered an inlier, which, is, which are all these points here. And because it's an inlier, it's within our model, the cost is zero. And all these other points here, would the cost would be one. So this model is a very bad model because there are more outliers, points outside of the model, than points inside the model. And here is a simple uh, description of how RANSAC works. So in, in number one, basically we have all these points, and we want to get um, 
we want to get a model that basically fits all these points. So we see that we select two points in um, diagram two, then we draw a line through it, well create our model. In this case it's a line, that's number three. Then we do our uh, evaluation. So these are the deltas here, and any points within these uh, deltas are considered in layers. So at this point our model cost is well they have one, two, three, four, five, six in layers and a lot of outliers. Then we do our um, algorithm again. And this second time, we see like two better points, and we draw a line. And here we can see that a lot more points are actually inside our model. So we would pick up, choose the second model, number five over number four. So there are some, some parameters that uh, we need to define before we actually use answer. And I'll come to why I am talking about all of this in a little while why I am using Ransack and why, I'm, why I had to code it up and build this um, robust regression method. So, but before we get to why, the why let's, let's um, show you how Ransack um, operates. So the point here is we want to get this, we are going to show you the delta, we want to get um, an appropriate delta. Basically, if you look at this function here, we want a delta such that the probability of the errors at, uh, at a point if the probability of the error is less than or equal to delta, this probability is the probability of an inlier. That might seem kind of complicated, but basically we want the probability of a point that is inside our model, we want that probability to be the probability that is an inlier. Don't worry too much about the maths right now, you can ask questions after. And then the second one is we want to know that minimum consensus threshold is the minimum number of points in our model that, um, that we can use to say that our model is correct. So in the previous example, um, they had, I think, six um, orange dots in our model. So we, know, we knew that six orange dots is not um, enough to create a good model, right? But to know how much, would, how much would be considered good enough, we would want it to be a value that is less than or equal to the number of inliers. Why? Because if the value is greater than the number of inliers, it means that there are outliers in our model. And as the whole point of answer, we don't want any outliers in our model. So the minimum number of points has to be less than or equal to the um, number of inliers. And the third, reason, the third one is the number of iterations. So as I said in the previous slide where they had four and five, how the um, algorithm selected two different, um, um, two different data points. The number of times this um, algorithm runs is given by this seemingly complex equation here, but it's not really. And that's how um, Ransack works in a nutshell. So the next slide is uh, accept. So what accept is, this is the bulk of my work here. This is what I lived and breathed for about three months of, out of the four of my internship. The first month I did the first one. The second, the, the, third, the second, third, and fourth months, I did answer and um, this um, problem, accept problem, concurrently. So what accept is, it's my mentor, Randy Martin. He actually wanted, he thought about developing a MATLAB toolbox. So what is MATLAB? MATLAB is just a programming environment, programming language, however you want to see it. So he wanted to develop a toolbox for MATLAB, such that we can predict or forecast adverse events in time series data. So it's similar to what IMS is doing. So it's something similar, but with Accept, we have a number of uh, algorithms implemented. So IMS is one algorithm. Um, Accept now is a framework that, ha that holds numerous algorithms. Right now, I think there are about six or seven algorithms right now in, Ac in Accept that is ready to work. And well, he hopes that this, what he's doing would drive other researchers to want to do similar stuff and be the catalyst for other similar toolboxes and other technologies coming out. So this is the last, last hard slide. The rest will be very simple. So this is how Accept works. So the first thing it does, it takes in data. I know some pre-processing feature selection I'll talk about normalization. And then it breaks up the data into training and validation and testing. So this is the training here and the validation and testing. So the training, just like IMS, 
has only nominal data, has nothing else. The validation testing has a nominal data in it. But the training, we only want to train on nominal data. So the training data, again, so I'll talk about RANSA, is a robust regression method. So here's where the regression methods are. So some of them are support, support vector machines, k layers, neighbors, binary neural networks, linear regression, quadratic regression, um, they have lasso, and I built RANSA. So that's where RANSA came in. I implemented an algorithm that was going to be placed inside and is actually placed inside Accept. So soon it's going to be open source. So when it's open source, everyone can see the code, etc. So that's what I built. I built this part. I built one of these um, regression methods to do this part. So this part, the, the generic regression, it is the learning part, meaning that just like how IMS had a knowledge base and it builds stuff, here, the generic regression um, box, what it does, it seeks to um, create a model, just like our answer created a model, but they have each of these algorithms create a model differently. And we want a model that's accurate, so that given us the inputs, given the training inputs, the output will be close enough to the actual output of the system. So that's what this um, part says here. So the residual is the difference between the actual and the predicted. And given the number of residuals, you can actually create a Gaussian distribution that we will use for these um, for this dotted box. So this dotted box is the prediction. This is the heart of accent. This is what makes it unique. So because they, all these SDR support vector machines by any other networks, those, those aren't unique. People have, have been working on that since the 80s, 90s. But what makes it unique is this little part here, the prediction now part. My mentor did his um, PhD thesis on this one here, optimal alarm system. Very complex and a lot, lot, lot of math. If I go to show that, everyone here will, <laughs> it might be a bit over some people's heads. So I don't even show any maths here. So basically, after the residual goes into the prediction, um, the prediction part, there's also validation testing data, and there's something called the linear dynamic system. This system modeled all the, um, all the dynamics, I should say, uh, all the dynamics, basically, that was not caught by the regression method. So it basically sweeps up all, all the missing um, patterns that the regression method didn't. And this, along with the Kalman filter, is applied to the op optimal predictive and SPRT. The optimal and predictive um, alarm systems, they are called level cross pre prediction systems. Basically, what they do is they analyze, give the residuals, I said it can be distributed causally, and it seeks to check the um, endpoints of the Gaussian distribution because the endpoints are where really the more than likely the anomalies are. So that's what those two uh, prediction systems does. The SVRD seeks to um, do some analysis on the mean and variance of the residuals. And the standard exceedance is the basic form. So standard exceedance basically says, well, if the residual is over x, well, that's anomalous. If it's under x, it's not normal. So this one doesn't do, deal with any probability. All these three here deal with a lot, a lot, a lot of probability. And so why did I create uh, uh, accept? I mean, why did Rodney create accept? Why did I do answer? Is to fix this problem. This problem basically was that in the same building, there's a lot of alarms going off in the pumping system. So we thought, what if we could create a system that actually predicts what an alarm would go off? And we use accept for this. So here you can see this diagram here is just for one day that shows that this point here and this point here are nominal. Why? Because any um, pressure that's within this range here is nominal. This here is when the pump is off. So there, there are two points in one day that give that gave an alarm. And there are a lot of alarms uh, going off. So these two red dots are for the same day. And all these dots here are anomalies. So we want, so it was given a lot of alarms, so we thought about what if we could actually predict when these alarms would occur. So before I get into the results that we got, there were two interns that worked in the summer that used a different algorithm than me. They used something called NUPIC. I wouldn't get into NUPIC, I used Accept. And what they did, they both did analysis with NUPIC on the same problem, and they got their results, and they created two different sets of features, and everything was independent. And what I did, I came in and I 
use their features um, concurrently and applied accept and all its methods to these um, features and to all the data, all, all the same um, criteria that the previous interns were, the previous interns did. So I basically did both their jobs in, the, in that time period. And the, they use one algorithm, you pick and accept, because they use accept, we use a set of um, algorithms, regression methods, linear, quadratic, and all the um, prediction methods that I had previously. So there, there was a lot of uh, a lot of algorithms working here that I used. And then this is the results that we got. This is the first, first set of results that we got. For the, the interns, the best intern, he got a full alarm rate of almost zero, which, which is very good. Missed detection rate, it didn't miss any alarms, but the advanced detection time was zero, meaning that it only predicted, it only predicted an alarm when the alarm occurred, which is exactly what the system in NASA has already. So that's not very good. For accept, the prediction time, uh, the prediction time was 60 seconds before an alarm occurred. Accept could predict, but drawback is that it had a lot of false alarms, meaning that accept said many times that there were alarms, but in actuality there wasn't. So this is not, so the two of them there, the missions of the results, they weren't that great. But I don't have the other results yet because NASA, you know, quite priority, they didn't want, I couldn't release all the results as yet. But I can release, release these results, why? Because they weren't good, right? So they, they allow, allow me to release this. So the other results they are working on, and I will go back and work on it. But I can tell you that what happened after we did some more an analysis was that the false alarm rate dropped to, this is coming to the end of my internship, dropped to um, less than 0.2. And the advanced detection time only dropped by about 50, dropped about 50 seconds. So even though the, uh, the uh, detection time dropped slightly, the false alarms, which is what we wanted, dropped even more. So with more uh, uh, research going into this, we can actually implement this into NASA's um, piping system. So right now we are doing testing on it. They, well, they are doing testing on it. I'm not there right now. So we're testing the accuracy of this even further. So when I go back, I will enhance and I will uh, build upon the work that was done, that is being done currently. And hopefully we can actually implement the system in throughout the whole of NASA's sustainability based um, building. And this here um, brings you to the benefits. Why you want that? Just like IMS, you want, the, you want to have a prediction so that the maintenance staff could come and fix an alarm before it happens. Why? Because it could cause damage to the building. And there are a couple other reasons that we would want to um, have, we want to solve this problem. And that brings me to the end. So this is the post I did with my research on accept and the piping problem. And I have the poster here if anyone wants to come and see it afterwards. I wouldn't go through it, but it's I had a really good opportunity to not only present my work to um, a lot of scientists at NASA, but also to scientists from Carnegie Mellon University and UC Berkeley University, which was a very um, scary but uh, um, gratifying experience for me. So I wouldn't go through it. We basically kind of summarize what I said. There's the same um, diagram that I was allowed to release with the bad results, unfortunately. So this is um, this brings me to the end of the um, speech, the pre presentation, and I advise anyone who wants to apply or who's thinking to apply that they should apply. It was a really good um, opportunity, and I thank Dr. Mohan, Sean, everyone for doing that they could to not only send me to NASA, but bring me back safely and have all this all these wonderful opportunity to um, give back and um, I, um, share my knowledge that I gained from NASA. Thank you. All right, y'all, so we'll have the short Q&A. Um, any questions? Sean? Data that's available on injuries 
um, and create hotspots, which is what you want within our field to see, okay, this is something that needs to be addressed. So your model is trying to not actually identify those hotspots, to actually say a hotspot might be there in the future. Yes? Yeah, so that's an asset. Uh, so with, it would say we have, with this probability, there would be an alarm in the next, well, for medical, it might be there might be a hotspot, I don't know until in the next 45 seconds. So yeah, there would no, be no, alarm. it's not times like that. You're talking about, I mean, this is not clinical medicine, this is public health, so you're talking about within an area. Um, it's like oh. picking up a crime hotspot. Oh. So it's the, 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 that, that. That's the, the software is SatScan, which actually was developed in crime, but is actually applicable in more than one space to identify a hotspot as regards something oh. else. Okay, so I'm, so I'm trying to see whether your system would be applicable out, because you said it's applicable everywhere else. It's like, um, I asked this question mainly because uh, when I started, when I heard about industrial engineering, when I went in, I said, that's exactly what I do, but I do it for people. You know, so a lot of the things you actually identify are applicable elsewhere in, in other fields, and people actually don't actually go on that and, and, and tell somebody, say, hey, you know, this could help me. Um, so it's the same thing I'm asking one. And then the other question was, before when you identify the two in the two the two by two diagram, you said you chose uh, equal when the false positive was yeah. equal to the false negative. My question was why? Why? Because that's just what um, our well, I that's what um, what Lee said first to use. Why? It could there could be a number of reasons that he decided to choose that because maybe he wanted. He didn't want it. So in certain situations, I'll answer the second one first. In certain situations, you might want a high, higher true positive rate than um, a higher true positive rate. Meaning that, so for example, a bank might want to um, ensure that, let's say they're dealing with credit card fraud or something, they might want to make sure that they um, use that all the instances of credit card, possible credit card fraud are highlighted to them. So that's why when you might want a, a high true positive rate, but because there's a high true positive rate, there'll be a high false positive rate, meaning that many people who are not doing anything suspicious would be flawed, but a banking system would prefer have the overhead. Well, I hope that they would prefer have the overhead and check all these um, innocent people. They rather they, they get flawed and they check it and be like, oh, okay, well that's um, they're okay, and rather than they have people um, being swept under the rug. So the reason why we wanted to choose equal error rate, I can't answer that. That that that. that. So choose it whether you want a, a high um, a high true positive and a high false um, a high false positive or a low false positive and a low true um, false positive or equal. That is a that is that is a business decision that the business has to decide how they want their system to operate. We really want the system to operate equally. So that that's, that's the best I can give you for that one. I, it's just a business decision. So he thought that that was the best one out of um, all. For the first instance, where, um, where they could detect hotspots, um, you're talking more like with people. So like if there's crime in a certain area. So yes and no, depending on the type of data that you get. So if you get, um, it depends on the data. So if the data isn't, it's scarce, there isn't much data, well, you can't at least these systems would not um, operate as accurate. So the more data you have, the better. So if the data that you can gather from different hotspots is a lot, well, a lot in enough to satisfy these requirements and the features are actually um, properly correlated to our incident happening, then yeah, it could be applied. But if there isn't proper data, then no, it wouldn't be able to, these um, systems wouldn't be able to um, apply to the hotspot. I'm predicting a hotspot somewhere. But if there's good data here, yeah, why not? Yeah, hi, um, with respect to the inductive monitoring system, um, would you talk a bit about the, well, both the inductive monitoring system and the accept system? Would you talk a bit about the processing power that's required 
to, uh, to actually uh, predict some of these things. And also as well, uh, in terms of control for the IMS, um, is it possible that it um, could have, like, for example, use a random, a random generator, sorry, no, for the, for the IMS, if you, could, you, if you can compare that system, performance of that system, with uh, just simple thresholds, right? Okay, yeah. And also as well with the, with the accept system, uh, in terms of a control as well, just like a, a random white noise generator, and look at the performance of that, right? But that's one set of, the other thing that in my mind is that, for example, how well does the system work you know, with, the, with the amount of time, this time series data for yeah. the accept system? The more, the more time data you have, how, 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 um, how that does affect the performance of the prediction? Okay, so let me see if I can answer all, right? Sorry. sorry. Um, <laughs> the first one, I think, was the processing power. So IMS is an extremely efficient um, algorithm. So we use, I can't remember how much data we used, but I think it was like about, let's say between about four to six months, probably, right? Which, which is a lot, every minute for four to six months. And it, I think it was about four months, and it, it could have actually done the knowledge base, created a knowledge base, that, that's what takes up all the, most of the processing time. That knowledge base would have taken a couple seconds, but accept now, it'll take longer. So that same data, it'll take even longer, depending on the algorithm you choose. So support vector regression takes a long time to run. Um, linear regression takes a short time, etc. So depending on this, the particular um, predictive models and uh, regression models that you choose, that will be power, the uh, time would vary. So if you see like, uh, a long regression method, a long prediction method, like all the probability ones, SPRT, um, optimal prediction. Those will take really long. But what you said for the third person I'm coming to now is when they can just have a threshold and say if it's above this, flag it and um, take it. So that's what we have for um, Accept. Accept has one of those actually built in. That's the um, standard, the standard one, the last um, box that I had. That, that is what it did. It had a threshold, so if it's above the threshold, it's flagged as anomalous. If it's below, it's uh, not normal. For IMS, you use, so you could have built something similar to um, the, so let's say you can say, oh, if the system goes into 20 watts flat, it has um, an, um, an, an, an anomaly, but without prior knowledge, you, don't, you, do, you would not know what that system, what error that system would to give in the future. So that is what um, it does. It checks, it, it builds the system only 13 watts and you don't know if it's going to be 14, 15, 16. So 14 watts, it might not say anything. But 15 watts, it might show some um, anomalies. 20 watts will definitely show an anomaly. So you don't know how, what error you're going to get. So that's why we use um, IF as well, and saying, oh, well, if it's 20, we flag it. presentation and again look out for, for another one in um, July based on electrical engineering and capacitors and whatnot from our second interview. Right. Thank you.